The other thing I want to talk to you for a moment about, uh, this, uh, this past week, on Friday, I was sitting at the cafe uh, back at my uh, fourth office. I have about four offices now. And uh, I was sitting back at a table. Um, about 30 minutes before uh, what I'm about to tell you happened, two very nice ladies were in the cafe, and uh, they ordered their, I think I took their order maybe. And anyway, uh, they sat down. They had lunch. I saw them sitting there in the cafe. And uh, I happened to be looking up when they, they stood up to walk out of the cafe. They were done with lunch and seemed happy and delighted with their experience. And they left. They left the cafe. About five or so minutes later, here they came back in the door. And uh, they may even be here this morning. I don't know if they are. Welcome. And uh, they came back in the door. I saw them stop at the register. They said something to Tracy, uh, Tally, and then uh, they walked back to where I was sitting, uh, where, uh, at the back of the cafe. The one lady says, uh, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I know you're a pastor. And uh, I think I recall her saying she had visited our church a time or two. And she said, um, and began to get emotional, and she said, this is my friend, and we just got reconnected again, and she has, she's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And we got to thinking, um, would you be willing to pray for her? And I said, um, well, absolutely. And so I stood up and hugged her, and, and I said, uh, so tell me about your relationship with Jesus. And she said, well, I haven't been to church for a while, but I need to. And I said, well, that's not exactly the question that I asked you. I said, I said, church is important, but what's more important is where are you with Jesus? And she said, well, yes, sir, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I said, that's what's important to me at this moment. And I said, uh, God will God will guide and direct you to church, but so there were two men, uh, regular customers in the cafe, who uh, I know, and one in particular, um, uh, been well. He he comes in a lot, and we we talk a lot, we talk about the Lord a lot, and uh, encourage him and in, in his walk with the Lord. And, so they were sitting there, and so I asked the lady, I said, ma'am, I said, there are two Christian brothers sitting at that table right there. Would you mind if I invited them to come and, and join us in this time of prayer? And I knew particularly the one was a man of faith, and, and I knew that he would be able to agree with us in praying for this woman's healing. And then as we gathered in the back and standing around this lady and the staff came over. We didn't have any customers coming in the door at that moment. And I believe Tracy and, and uh, Myrtle was there. And, and um, I think maybe Tori, one of our other employees, I can't remember. And so here's all of us gathered around in the cafe praying for a woman to be healed of breast cancer. My question to you is this. Is that church? Is it really? Are you sure? Are you sure that that can only happen right here? <laughs> no. Y'all make me proud. Um, the Gateway Cafe is as much church as we're experiencing right here this morning. And why? Because it's made of the people of God. See, it is a mission center. It's an outpost. I like to call it a mission outpost into our community. 
see at the cafe, and, and there's a reason I'm, I'm sharing these things with you. I'll get to more of it in a moment. At the cafe, I also had an experience. Some of you may have seen it on Facebook. Every month we have a roundup program, as you know. If you come in, your whatever your bill is, we'll ask you if you want to round it up to the next whole dollar. Sometimes that might be five cents, it might be 95 cents or whatever. It's amazing how much a little bit of change adds up at the over a whole month. We average, we average over a thousand dollars a month in roundup. Isn't that awesome? The cafe, uh, the cafe, we, we just actually wrote a check uh, for nearly, it was just short of $1,000 for the West Virginia, uh, for our um, Operation Compassion for West Virginia. We just wrote a check from last month's uh, roundup that will help to buy supplies and things that the group is going to need. Well, here just a few weeks ago, one of the young men that we had sponsored, his name's Ryan. Ryan's a young man, 24 years old. He's been diagnosed with cancer. He's been battling cancer for about a year. And we get names of people through our customers, through you and the congregation. Uh, we pray about it. We can't do every one every month. We choose one person or one cause a month. So I, I contacted Ryan's mom and said, I'd like to come and present the check uh, to you. And so he was at UVA at that time. He's now home. Um, but uh, and, and we need to continue to pray for his healing. It doesn't uh, look good right now. But the day I was there, I took some anointing oil with me, not knowing if they would be open to that. We had a good visit. We talked about, you know, we didn't know each other. We were just getting acquainted. And before I left, I said, Ryan, um, I said, would you be okay if I prayed for you? And he said, well, I need all the prayer I can get. I know that only God can heal me. That was a 24-year-old young man walking and battling cancer, walking with and battling cancer. So I said, well, Ryan, I brought some anointing oil. I don't know if you've ever been anointed with oil. And I said, but, and I shared with him James chapter 5 when it talks about if anyone is sick, call upon the elders of the church, come and pray over them that they may be healed. He said, that would be fine. And so here, Ryan and his mom and I, we had a time of prayer for healing and anointing him with oil. Right there in UVA, in that hospital room. Let me ask you something. Is that the church? Did we have church? Yeah. We had church. This week, as I mentioned, our roundup, we've also supported the West Virginia disaster, flood victims. I was back there on Monday for uh, Dwayne's brother's funeral, which was an amazing time in the Lord. Still praying for you, brother. And part of what we had to do was ride through White Sulphur Springs again. And folks, the, the, those folks are still hurting. And, and I told you early on, when we got involved in the relief work, we've been doing this. It's not our first rodeo in doing things like this. But when the, nat the national media only stays while it's hot news, as long as they can benefit from it, then they stay, but then they move on. They move, I told you, they were going to move on as soon as, you know, everybody become disinterested or it was no longer creating the ratings that they need. They moved on a long time ago. But that community went to work. It's probably one of the most well-organized relief efforts I've ever been a part of. And I've been a part of a few of them. So this week, we're asking for people to give a day of their time and their talents and their resources to go and to minister to a guy who's had a bad experience with church. You see, this really isn't about going and putting up drywall. It is. I mean, that will be a great help and a great benefit, would it not? Fix some carpet, 
maybe fix some heat. But we're going to do more than rebuild his house. We're going to rebuild his hope that there is a genuine, authentic, loving, and accepting, and a gracious God who loves him. That is what's important. If you didn't catch that vision during the announcement, I just want to recast it to you again. And it doesn't matter whether you've ever hung a sheet of drywall or not. If you can go and make a difference in a man's life who has been turned off by the church, and that's not to... We don't know the circumstances around it, and we don't need to know. But as long as... I know that if this church will show up in Rupert, West Virginia, next Saturday, whether it's five people or 50, I know that I know that I know that that man's life is going to be impacted for the kingdom. So when you go to Rupert, and spend a day in a man's house, is that the church? Are you going to have church on Saturday? Sure you are. Someone asked me recently if I was filling in for another employee at the cafe. They said, we sure see you here a lot, or y'all short on help. I said, no, I just like the food and the coffee. Well, sometimes that may be the case. But actually, it's much more strategic. You see, that is part of my pastoral role in the ministry right now. You see, I compare it a little bit. Over the years, we've had folks leading our youth ministry. This happened, I think, about three different times. We had folks leading our youth ministry, and then there became a need for someone to lead our youth ministry. The cafe is just another extension of our ministry, part of our ministry. And so when, when there was a need in our youth ministry, I was not only the senior pastor of the church, but I became the youth pastor as well. And sometimes that season would last a couple years. Sometimes it may be shorter, but... That's how we have approached ministry is that where the need is, we discern the alignment of the pastoral leadership in our church and the skills to fill that need. Well, right now, one of my primary ministries as your pastor is to lead our mission outpost down the street. And I can tell you, there is so much pastoral ministry that's going on in that place that it far exceeds the amount of pastoral ministry that takes place in that office back there in that corner. It's every day. People coming and going and reaching their hearts for Jesus. I'm excited about it. Doesn't mean I'll stay there for long. I don't intend to be there forever. Doing that, we'll see where the Lord leads. I know it doesn't look traditional and I told you when we decided two years ago to open a cafe that it will take us outside the box of our four-walled Christianity. Amen? We still have people come in and they'll scratch their head and they'll say, wait a minute, did I hear, like, is this owned by a church? Who, who, I, who runs this? They look confused. And I said, well, we're about as confused as you are. So, but actually we're not. I said, no. I'll tell them the truth. I'll say, actually, no. The church, Cornerstone Church, owns the cafe. And uh, it's, a, it's a full business. It's a full-blown corporate business. It's like any other restaurant that is run in the community. We pay our employees. Uh, we cannot legally hire volunteers, not pay people. We have to run it like any other business. And it's tough. It's hard work. It doesn't look traditional. The vision was to plant the church in the marketplace where we can minister to people who, ain't, who may never darken the door of a church building. So you, if you see me at the cafe more than you think a traditional pastor should be, just know I'm pastoring. I'm making coffee too and doing other things, and, uh, but it's part of ministry. And I love it. 
I absolutely love. I love being in the marketplace. I love how our staff has caught hold of the vision as well. So I invite you to come and see what the Lord is doing. I could stand here for the next hour and tell you story after story after story of how we have prayed and ministered and witnessed to people at the cafe. And we believe it is making a change in people's lives. The food is awesome. But the ministry is amazing. It is amazing. It's not perfect. We're still learning a lot, I can tell you that. I do ask that you would, you know, come and sip on a cup of coffee or, you know, enjoy a slice. Is Myrtle here this morning? Where is she? She's usually over here somewhere. Maybe she's not here. Well, she's probably home resting because we work her hard. But I'll tell you one thing, if the anointing oil doesn't heal someone, her peanut butter pie will. It's one or the other, you know. They both go down smooth, all right. And I'm telling you, it is amazing what that woman can cook and, uh, and bake for us. But, it is a, but I ask that you would come and partner with us in prayer because it is another place where the church is at work. The church is at work at UVA, the church is at work at the cafe, the church is at work here this morning, the church is at work in your marketplace wherever you spend your time every day for eight or plus hours, the church is at work in your home, the church is at work in your life groups. And so come and partner with us. So I'm, I'm going to tie this together here in just a moment. We're going to get to the meat of the scripture here but a church member asked me recently if the cafe was making a profit well the simple answer to that is no not yet it's amazing when you start something that looks so good on the outside everybody thinks you're making bank you know and uh, but we're 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 not where we started and we're not where we're going to be in the future um, just so you know, uh, I, I saw a Bloomberg report recently that approximately 60% of all new restaurants fail within the first year. We're coming up on our first year in December, and we will not be part of that 60% or that 40 <laughs> Over the course of five years, they reported only three out of every five restaurants survive under the same ownership. So they either went out of business or turned it over to someone else. Well, I feel like we're, um, we're on a different track. And God's grace is a part of it. And keep praying for us because, you see, the bottom line, the bottom line for us is not the food and the profit it's the ministry and we're going to keep working hard we're not going to just you know somehow think well God's just going to drop it all in our lap but we're going to work hard at the profit side but we're going to work even harder at the ministry side so that is just to give you a little bit of an update but also to say thank you for believing in this ministry Thank you. Thank you for supporting it. Thank you for coming and bringing your friends and, and, and helping the cafe to, to be a place that where the church can exist in the marketplace. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. And I want to give some context for what I've shared so far and, and kind of lead us into how we might apply this Luke 14, verse 12. Then Jesus turned to his host. 
When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Have you ever been invited to something, and you were invited to someone's party, and then when you threw a similar party, you felt an obligation to invite them back to yours? You ever given a Christmas or been given a Christmas gift and then felt obligated? You went uh, running to Walmart at the last hour and bought a gift in exchange because you thought that the way that you would reward the gift that you received would be to give a gift? You ever felt that? I know none of you. I'm just talking about all the other people outside the room. Well, what Jesus is saying here is that you know, when we invite maybe people in our inner circle, you know, to a banquet, to a luncheon, sometimes there's this feeling that there's an obligation to reward that back. Like, hey, all right, I need to invite that person out the next time and, and I need to pay for their lunch. That's what he's talking about. He said, but instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. And so Jesus is saying that we as followers of his are to go out and find people who can't even begin to imagine to pay us back. Nor should that be our reward. He says our reward will be when we are with the Father. That we, our return on the investment of our time of reaching out to those who are poor and crippled and blind, those who are in need, those who need the Lord to touch their lives, our reward will be in heaven, not on earth. He goes on to say, he says, hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. You see, any luncheon, any banquet, we invite someone who is in need to, they could never even come close to mimicking or comparing to the banquet that we will experience when we are with the Father for eternity. Isn't that awesome? So any reward, any payback luncheon will always fall short of what our eternal banquet, our eternal luncheon will be with the Father. <coughs> he says, Jesus replied with a story. He says, a man, <coughs> excuse me, a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses, and one said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen, and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I have a wife, so I can't come. I'm not even going to touch. I'm not even going to. I'm not. I just want you to know I may make commentary on every other verse here but that one. I'm just reading the Bible, okay? I didn't write it. <laughs> the servant returned and told his master, what he had said, what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And after the servant had done this, he reported, There is still room for more. And so his master said, Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house 
will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Now what does this have to do with what I've been sharing so far? As followers of Christ, we have probably become frustrated at times when we have felt that the Lord has prepared us to prepare an opportunity for people to come and experience the joyful presence and the provision of God, right? And you've sent out invitations and people have made all kinds of excuses. You've heard it, you know. Yeah, in Jesus' time, some guy went out and bought a, bought a couple, couple of new oxen. Today, well... I won't mention a list because I don't want anybody to think I'm talking about you. But we buy all kinds of things that we want to try out and that we'll use. Well, you know, Pastor, I just got this or I just got that. I got to go and try this out. I got to do this, got to do that. I can't be there. I can't, you know, I can't come to this. I can't participate in that. I can't do this. I'm too tied up. The world that we live in today is too tied up. Everybody's tied up. And the enemy, I tell you, the devil is having a heyday. We're tied up. And the church, though, is to keep going out and giving the invitation for people to come and experience the joyful provision of God. But yet we get discouraged by the excuses that we hear, don't we? And maybe some of us have actually used those excuses ourselves. We said, well, you know, I really can't. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is to go to West Virginia. But I can imagine some of us, well, you know, I've got this and I've got that. And, I, you know, next week and there's no way I could go to West Virginia. There's no way I could give up a day out of 365 of them. There's just no way, Pastor. You don't know my life. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Now, if you're getting married next week, you might have a case. Or we've got one that's on a honeymoon right now. Had the joy of marrying a beautiful couple last uh, yesterday, yesterday morning. Derek and Melissa Coleman. I see mom and dad back there. How you doing? All right. We doing okay? Oh, by the way, um, if you are looking to get married, you have a desire to get married, I encourage you to sign up. If you're a young adult, sign up for my life group. What are y'all talking about? Hey, there's an anointing. If you come to my life group, you will get married. I'm sorry, dear. You're going to get married and you're going to change life groups. It's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. I can't help it. Look, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. I've done four weddings this year since May. All four weddings were members of my life group. All right? So, Clement, when you got the anointing, you got the anointing. Right, brother? I mean, I can't, I can't deny it. So, uh, anyway, that's just a little side note. But we're having a great time. Josh and Taylor, they're getting married next week. I think that's the last one for the year. But I'm not going to put a period at the end of that statement. All right? But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So where were we? Here's where we were. So you have, you've given that invitation, and we can become discouraged. I told a group of uh, life group leaders that Sherry and I were training in the Harrisonburg Church a few weeks ago that I remember one time uh, well, actually, I'll go back to one that 
happened right here. Uh, we started a life group a couple years ago, Sherry and I. We had several couples in our congregation who were saying, y'all need to start a couples group. Y'all need to start a, a couples life group. And uh, so we prayed about it, you know, and finally we decided we're going to start a couples life group. And uh, so we contacted, I think it was about six couples. Um, I think about four of them were the ones saying, you need to do this. So we and had it all set up. We invited them to come. And that first night, nobody showed up. Not a soul. Not a soul. Sherry and I ate snacks till about 12. <laughs> we had plenty. <laughs> so we, we were meeting, you know, we were going to meet uh, twice a month. And so then the next time came around, we had about, you know, we had a few people say, well, you know, we really wanted to come, we really wanted to come. So we opened up our home again, and nobody showed up. Not a soul. Not one. So I think we tried it three times, I believe it was. On the third one, and nobody showed, we said, well, we've got to go at a little bit further down the path to find people that want to come. And uh, we, you know, we, we got discouraged. It was like, and these were people in our church. These were people we were hanging out with, you know, every Sunday. So when I told, I told Sherry um, back last year, I said, you know, I really feel like God wants me to lead a young adult life group. And I'll be honest, uh, and I shared this with uh, the life group in one of our early meetings when we started back last, last fall. When my very first life group that I led as a young believer, um, I'd been a Christian, I think, for about probably two years, and a couple in our community, they were discipling Sherry and I, and they said, you know what, we really feel like you need to lead the group and most of the people that were in our life group at that time were either still in high school or they were post high school. And so I went into that house that night and I was so ready, man, I had prepared for hours. Nobody showed up. Not a soul. Not a single person. Happened for two weeks. Nobody showed. I just took the time. I just prayed, you know. And Sherry was away at that time. I think she... It was her first year, second year in college. And, you know, I, I could have just stopped right there, but I just kept praying and kept inviting people. And before you know it, people started coming. We filled the house over a matter of weeks and months to the point that then when I went off to college in Harrisonburg, some of the, uh, some of the members were going to JMU. And while I was, um, while I was at EMU, they asked me to come over to JMU and lead a life group uh, among them. And so I did that. I went and was leading a life group there. Here's the point. Jesus said that we're going to experience a day when the hearts of many will wax cold. And that believers, that, their that the followers of Jesus will allow their love to diminish. The church in America right now has grown cold. And the people that we thought would get excited about Jesus are making all kinds of excuses not to be with Jesus and not to be with the people of God, and not to be a part of the mission of God. So my encouragement to you is this. You can either focus on who's not coming or reach further outside of your circle and find the ones who are hurting. Find the ones who need the Lord 
in their life. And so your life group, I am commissioning this morning every life group. Do not depend on the website registration to place people in your life group. Jesus said, we'll give that. We are giving that invitation, and many will find excuses not to attend the banquet that you set up in your household or somebody else's household week after week after week. There will be many who will find many reasons not to be there, not to experience the presence of God and His people. But Jesus said, He said, go out further. He said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys and the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant came back and said, you know what? I still have room in my house. And Jesus said, no problem. He said, Go further. Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. The house will be full. Friend, we are the church in the world. We are the church. A website is not going to attract people always. It may grab a hold of some. A digital sign by the road. We were joking the other day. When the sign that we replaced was the most pathetic, poor looking, I mean dilapidated sign you have ever seen. We had letters blowing off of that thing. And it was amazing how many people would show up at our church and we'd say, how'd you find us? Well, I was driving by and saw the sign. And it was embarrassing. It was like, you did what? I drove by and saw the sign. Oh, my goodness. God bless you. You must really thought we needed help. It was pitiful. But what is going to get the gospel to the people is you and I going out and being on mission. We've got to look behind the hedges, and we've got to go to the byways. We've got to look for people. Actually, the people are more visible than what we're willing to admit. They're all around us. There are people that are hurting. And you and I, we together are the church. That's why I love being in the marketplace at the cafe and seeing people that come in. There have been times we have another man who walked into our cafe. I think his very... No, it wasn't his first visit. It may have been his second or so visit. And somehow we found out, and it was not hard to, to guess, that he was going through chemo treatments for cancer. And you could just tell he just looked weak. He, his, his, uh, the color in his face was just uh, you know, pale. And you could tell this man was suffering. And so... It was on like maybe his second or third visit. I was sitting in the front of the cafe and Donna came over and she said, Pastor, she said, this man needs prayer. And Donna had asked him, could we pray for you? And here Donna and I and, and, and his wife, we laid hands on him and we began to pray for healing. And we have seen a total transformation in this man. God is healing his body. He comes in, he and his wife, they come in about probably three or four times a week. They bring gifts to the cafe. You know, here we, we have baked goods, and one day he came in with a whole box of donuts and stripes. He said, I, I, I just wanted to bless you all today, and he brought us all donuts that day. That's... that's being in the marketplace. You're there. You're in the marketplace. All of your jobs are places where the sanctuary of God can be established. Are you hearing me this morning? Is it making any sense to you? Life groups are not intended to be households of people who focus inward and who work to preserve themselves and not allow others to come in. The life group must reach out and bring people in who need the Lord. Friend, I don't know where the byways and the highways and the hedges and the country lanes are in your life, 
but I encourage you and, and myself as well to open up our eyes to see the people who are traveling and hiding in those places who need Jesus in their life. This is not about growing your life group or growing the church. You know, Jesus will grow things. We just need to go and obey what he's asked us to do. Amen? He'll take care of, he'll take care of them. He'll take care of us. But we are to go. And this morning, I just wanted to get that message to you that we have got to go in the marketplace. I'm thankful that we can meet here on a Sunday morning. But friends, there are six other days of the week. Our Christianity has to be more than two hours on one day a week. It's got to be 24-7 until Jesus comes. Amen? Are you with me on that? I want you to stand to your feet. I'm invite the worship.